a brief introduction for those of us who are meeting Kevin for the first time. Uh, Kevin W.I. Lee is a photographer and creative director based in Singapore. He has worked in the creative industry in Asia and Australia for over 20 years. In 2010, he founded the Invisible Photographer Asia, which is the platform for photography uh, uh, and, and has some great works of uh, a lot of photographers uh, from all across Asia. Uh, through IPA, Kevin participates vigorously in photography and art across the region as a practitioner, a curator, and an educator. So that's a very short introduction I'm giving here, and I will let Kevin uh, share with us about uh, his journey uh, as a photographer and as an educator. Over to you, Kevin. All right. Uh, thanks. Hi, everybody. Thanks. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, let's how, where shall I begin? So I, I'll begin with the uh, IPA since you know you introduced me that way. So I started IPA uh, 2010, as you said, it started simply as a hobby by the side that I collated because I felt at that time, right, 2010, there weren't many online resources that were talking about photography in the region. Like whenever you went online and looked for information, it was always the international sort of uh, uh, portals. Uh, there were some that were very localized. For example, there were Photos that were very Indonesian, uh, everyone was speaking Bahasa, so it was very local. But there wasn't one that I, that I could consciously find that was um, continuing to sort of look at uh, the region and uh, publishing or doing efforts in a language that uh, the region could sort of uh, tap into. So that was basically the motivation behind uh, how uh, IPA started. So from there, it, uh, it was just a sideline gig. I was doing it. And then it got traction because people liked what, uh, what I was doing. And it, we, our audience kind of grew. Uh, and after that, I, I just felt that, okay, maybe it should be more than uh, a platform that exists online. So that's when I kind of took it a step further. And then I started uh, doing uh, talks because uh, I had a space back then. So I had talks. I started hosting talks presentations at my space. Uh, I don't have that space anymore because Singapore is very expensive, so I can't, I don't have that much money to sustain it for 10 years. So I don't have that space, but I, I did talks. And then following from there, I did, uh, started doing workshops uh, in Singapore. And then the, the next step after that was actually taking this physicality abroad. So I started, you know, going uh, to different countries and doing the same thing. So it's been, uh, 10 years now. So if you go to the site, you know, you'll see what we've been doing. Our, our archive goes back way back then. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of what, uh, what IPA is. Uh, if, if I can speak about IPA, I've just, uh, I mean, since I've been locked down as well, um, I've continued, I had, you know, producing stuff. So I've actually done like a series of videos uh, you know, doing a bit of editing. So they're posted, they've been, I've been posting that up uh, on our site as well. So yeah, that's right. kind of what, what I've been doing the past few weeks in lockdown. Right. And, and maybe uh, for our audience, can we maybe just give them a quick glimpse of uh, what IPA is like and, uh, you know, just for them to get a sense of, uh, I'm sure people can check it out later. So just okay. get a glimpse. So you want me to share screen? Yeah, screen? just uh, do a share. If you have IPA open, then you can just do a share screen. Yeah, I'll just bring up my site and just do a quick. Okay, so this is our website. Uh, you guys see, can you see? Yes, yes, we can see it. Okay, so what I've, I, I've archived here, I've been doing like, um, the past few weeks, I've offered uh, free uh, weekly editing for Asian photographers. So as you can see, that's been posted online as well uh, on our website. So the first one we picked was, you know, someone from Philippines, India, and there's RG from uh, Indonesia, a young girl from Vietnam. And then last week or this week, uh, we did Raja from India as well. Um, so over the past few years, uh, we've 
posted, uh, we've, given out, we've given out grants, as you can see here, to some of the, because uh, I've been doing mentorship programs for right. quite a few years now that I take on like a small group of uh, participants, usually five, six, seven, eight uh, from across the region. And uh, we, uh, we do a um, four month mentorship program where they work on projects. So sometimes I give out grants. Um, so as you can see, some of the projects have been all across from Hong Kong, Vietnam, India. Um, it also shows some of our efforts. Like for example, we did a visualizing social stories in Delhi recently at last year. Mm -hmm. We did that with Tanvi. Um, Tanvi Mishra, yes. Yeah. So that was uh, a very nice experience. And this is interesting because actually for this particular workshop that we do, um, most of the participants are not photographers. They are kind of uh, social workers, activists, uh, campaigners. So it, it's quite interesting for us to do this uh, kind of workshop because uh, basically, uh, this is done with uh, my partner, Robert, uh, who comes from a um, human rights, uh, social organization sort of background. So he, he brings that expertise and then I bring the, the, the visual expertise and then we kind of teach that to uh, organizations, NGOs that uh, would like to acquire that skill, which is using visual stories or photographs to campaign to raise funds, to fight for causes and all that. So uh, we've been doing this for quite a few years now and, and I've been really, it's been quite a interesting experience as well, meeting all these different types of people, uh, very passionate about what they do and all kind of fighting for causes, all different kinds of causes across the region. Right. And yeah. uh, just a quick question, uh, Regarding visualizing uh, social stories, do you also directly work with communities uh, to train them? Uh, like, have you ever tried uh, that? Or is it mostly just organizations who are working in the social space? Uh... Um, well, my, uh, my partner, Robert, uh, he does that because that's kind of his expertise and he's so uh, the last few years he was based in Hong Kong and he's been working with uh, migrant worker rights like uh, domestic workers. So right. he's done quite a few projects uh, in that area. Okay. Uh, uh, and but on, on my end, I, I don't really, that's not really my expertise, but you know, once in a while I, I, I do projects here and there that are somewhat related, but, but not as much as he does. So he, he does that. Right. On, on our side, in terms of IPA, we've, we've done like uh, open workshops where uh, we put out a call and then people join uh, but okay. we've also uh, done private workshops for particular uh, organizations that uh, just for their staff uh, right. for example yeah okay okay and is there any i mean i know now it's going to be hard to do workshops uh, you know in physical spaces in different parts of the world but is there something that uh, you are planning to do in the near future maybe virtually um, well, actually, uh, I've, I've kind of uh, taken a hiatus from doing workshops for a while now. Like, I think uh, I haven't really done a workshop since, uh, a physical workshop since uh, our Delhi one, I think, which was last year, mid last year. So I've kind of taken a break somewhat. Um, so moving forward, I'm not, I'm not sure like how, how, because sometimes, I mean, teaching workshops can be quite, exhausting sometimes I, I was doing yeah. a uh, online mentorship which uh, I, I did find quite fulfilling because then it's a few months and then you kind of uh, stick with a participant for a period of time and watch them develop while mm -hmm. as if you do like physical workshops where it's three days right you know it's great for certain things but then you know you don't uh, especially for photographers you don't see you don't grow with the project with them you know mm -hmm. so uh, but even then, uh, the mentorship program that I've been doing for quite a few years now, they, they're all virtual. So right. even before this lockdown thing happening happened, I was doing that like very much like how we are talking now. Uh, I was doing that with my mentorship program. So we would have uh, progress meetings and there'd be like someone from India, someone from uh, Myanmar, Hong Kong. And then, you know, we would all 
uh, go online and then uh, talk about our projects and then go off and do the project and then come back again in, in uh, like a few weeks and then go through it again. Uh, so, so it's, I think that format is interesting because it, uh, it removes the issue of geography. So I could have a workshop where there's like someone from India, someone from Myanmar, someone from China, someone from uh, Thailand participate. And of course, each country, each person has a sort of slightly different cultural perspective and historical perspective. So when they do a project, it's, it's you know, the perspectives are always different. So it's always very beneficial to someone, for someone to go through that process of, uh, say for example, me in Singapore, looking at you doing your project in India and then your perspective, you know, and that right. allows me to self-reflect, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that's, uh, I think that's a very good format. Uh, but the, the negative side of that is that the participants have to be very self-driven because, yes. you know, um, they, once they get off the meeting, they have to get out there and do their own shit. They have to do it, you know, because there's no one there, you know, so it's not like, okay, you do it and then you have to show up to class tomorrow. Uh, mm -hmm. And then if you don't have anything, then you get a beating or whatever. So they have to be very independent and very driven, um, especially when it's a long-term thing for them to be able to stay driven and mm -hmm. be able to work persistently, you know, without drifting away. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And how I, I think that's going to be harder in the current times where we are not even able to step out much and uh, travel. Uh, yeah. So uh, I guess uh, what you're doing right now, the editing tables, the editing sessions, yeah. uh, is a great exercise uh, for a lot of photographers because we keep, uh, you know, shooting so much and putting it all in our hard disks. And yeah. looking at the same work, maybe even if it is a few years later, and especially when somebody else is looking at it, turns into a completely different experience. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I would like to now uh, move to uh, your book that uh, you recently came out with, uh, 100 uh, Daughters, 100 Patients, 100 Meals. Uh, yeah. That's a very interesting title. And uh, I know you might have uh, done this many times before, uh, probably in other interviews and stuff as well. But uh, could you share a little bit about why, what, what is this title? What is the background to it? And uh, uh, what is the story? Yeah. Okay, so I'll just show the book. Uh, so it's, I've got a nice light shining here for the first time. <laughs> I set this up just for this. So, so yeah, this is the book. Um, so the title is... Uh, 100 daughters, 100 patients, 100 meals. So basically what uh, the 100 daughters, where it comes from is actually, um, it's my uh, father's name. So when my father was a boy, when he was born, my um, grandparents uh, went and saw a, uh, a fortune teller and the fortune teller told my grandparents that uh, demons were out to get their firstborn son. So my father was the firstborn son. So, you know, the, the old school days, the old people, they're very superstitious and they believed it. So they tried to disguise my father as a daughter. So they called him a hundred daughters, which in Chinese is Pai Noi, or in Cantonese is Pak Noi, hundred, literally hundred daughters. So they tried to disguise my father as a daughter by giving, calling him that name and even right. like putting putting like earring earrings on his, um, on his uh, uh, ears. So that's where the hundred daughters comes from. Right. Okay. Then hundred daughters, hundred patients. The second part is hundred patients. So basically when he was, uh, when he grew up and he was a young man, he, of course he didn't like the name hundred daughters. He didn't want to be called hundred daughters. Yeah. So he changed it to hundred patients. Hmm. So in Chinese, Mm. Patients and daughters sounds very similar. Mm -hmm. So that's him changing his name to 100 patients. Okay. Uh, so that's where the 100 patients comes into the title. Right, right. Yeah. 
And then the final part is 100 meals. Basically, the book itself is a, um, uh, a tribute to my father. He, he actually passed away in uh, uh, nine, uh, 2018. Mm -hmm. So this project is basically a um, tribute to him. And uh, my father was a restaurateur, quite a successful restaurateur uh, when he was a young man. And that's kind of how he fed the family. And that's why I'm here, you know, because of him and his restaurant. So I decided to, uh, uh, you know, cook a hundred meals, a hundred recipes in, in his tribute. Uh, so the hundred meals comes into the title. So that's basically where the title comes from. Hundred patient, hundred daughters, hundred patients, and a hundred meals that I cooked. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, have you had experience of cooking before? Like even when he had his restaurant, which was in Fiji, right? Yeah. And and did, did you help him out even when you were younger? What are your memories of that time? Well, uh, I. I I, I, you know, when I was a kid back in Fiji, so I was born in Fiji. So Fiji is like in the South Pacific. I'm very far away from home. You know? Right. Interestingly enough, since we are talking about, we're talking with Chennai Photo Festival and all that, actually, you know, I, I grew up, when I was a boy, when I was a kid, I grew up watching Bollywood movies as well. Because actually, <laughs> in, in Fiji, there's a huge Indian population. There's a huge right. Indian diaspora. Mm -hmm. uh, the British kind of took uh, the Indians there as indentured laborers. Yes. So I'm very, I was very familiar mm -hmm. uh, with uh, Indian culture, or at least the diaspora. Mm -hmm. And actually, most of my, most of my father's uh, waiters and cooks, they were all Indian, you know. Um, oh, really? Yeah, yeah, they were all Indian. So, uh, so I, you know, we here at the restaurants, I helped out, but not in the kitchen. I was like front of desk, you know. Mm. So I was the boss's son, right? So I manned, I manned the till. Right. <laughs> So I never really learned, uh, officially learned how to cook from him. But obviously, you know, if you grow up uh, in a restaurant, hmm. you're looking at things every day. So you kind of know, okay, the prep chef does this. Uh, and then when they fry, you know, the heat has to be hot. And then, you know, the, they throw this much of salt in, you know. So okay. these were all sort of like ingrained in the memory. But I wasn't really a trained chef or anything like that. Okay. So the hundred meals that I cooked, basically, um, a lot of it was from scratch. So I had to sort of rely on my memory and then cross-reference, and then uh, that's kind of what I did. Um, and and your mother, uh, what does she feel about this? Like, I understand that uh, uh, she does not probably recollect a lot of uh, yeah. uh, things now, uh, but... Uh, like when you cook and you make something that probably was your father's recipe, uh, does it help her remember uh, some moments from the past? Well, my mother is quite old now, so and she has a bit of uh, dementia, so she actually her, um, her long term her memory is like not very good at all. Okay. But uh, what is interesting is that okay, the, the, <clears throat> I'll just show this right. Um, so essentially, what I have here. What I wanted to do was a photo book because, you know, that's what I do, photography. But I wanted to incorporate the food aspect as well. Uh, and I think with projects, right, I like projects that have multiple doors to enter. So during the course of doing this work, um, the project has resonated, obviously, with photographers because they like the photography, the, the uh, classic sort of, you know, black and white stuff. I think maybe I'll show a book yes. clip later. Yes, uh, um, it would be nice if you can also just show a few images on the screen uh, yeah. digitally as well. Yeah. So it can be, I'll just finish my sentence. So sure. basically I wanted uh, two doors. So basically uh, the book, uh, one part is photography. So I actually get an audience that actually is resonate with the photography. And you know, because I'm a photographer, I have people that like me for my photographs, they, they buy the book. But then I've also gained a new audience actually through the recipes. So essentially, uh, I often describe this project as uh, using photography and food to talk about my family history. 
so the recipes I've collated recipes that are that come from my history. So some of it are from my father's recipes. Some of it are from my childhood diaspora in Fiji. So the diaspora in terms of like my Cantonese Chinese background, the 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 Indian diaspora because I grew up with Indian chefs that uh, worked in the kitchen. So their taste palette got you know fused into my taste palette. Uh, so yeah, essentially that is what the book is. So what I'm going to do now, maybe I'll just share um, the uh, book flip so we can look at that. Yes, that would be nice. Okay, I'm going to play now. Hopefully it streams okay. Uh, yes, I think the issue is usually with just with buffering, but this is playing fine. Or not. So it comes with this flip out, which is the 100 pictures of the 100 meals that I made of the recipes. So this first part is basically the photo, photo book. So it's a mix of uh, images that I took and also archival images from our family. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, uh, I'm sure uh, everybody who's attending uh, has definitely got a glimpse of what this beautiful book is all about. And I hope that some of you will uh, place your orders. I don't know when you'll get the book, but at least uh, uh, do get a copy. Uh, I know I've been waiting to get mine. Uh, and tell us maybe, Kevin, a little more about the format uh, about this book, because it's a very interesting format, you know, where one yeah. side... So tell us a little more, how did you arrive at that? Uh, did you have somebody helping you with the design and also you self-published the book? So uh, why not share maybe some details about how that thought process came about? Yeah. So for this book, I, I worked with a designer. I mean, I, I have a design background, so I, I, I can design myself. Um, my previous book, I designed myself. But for this project, I wanted to let a second pair of eyes do the design. And I also wanted to focus on the, the recipes because I, my hands were full. Yeah. So I, I, I worked with a, uh, another designer. Uh, her name is Vanessa. She's Singaporean. Um, so actually, I, I was very, my brief to her was uh, uh, very particular uh, in the sense that I want a simple publication that is two books, but it's one book. Right. It's two books, but it's one book. Photo book and uh, cookbook, but it's one book. So, I mean, the simple thing to do is just do a case bound and to have two books in there. But then I, I felt like, uh, you know, it, that's, that's the obvious thing to do. So we came up, I told, based on that brief, she came up with this design, which I really like. Um, it looks deceptively simple, but, uh, you know, all you do is just flip and actually you can turn. But normally, if you look at a normal book, right? If you flip, you have to you have to turn it around before you, it it's, it orients the right way. Yes. So actually, that that was actually quite difficult to do. Like we we when I went to produce the book, uh, there were two printers that weren't uh, 
confident in pulling this fold off because if actually we know anything about printing, right? Mm -hmm. uh, this is quite tricky to pull yes. off yes. because the inside of this is the outside of that. So it, it's, it's like a zigzag. It's a zigzag, yes. Yeah. But I felt this was an important detail uh, to have that makes this a bit more special than if I were to just have two books. Definitely. And uh, some people pick it up, but actually some people they don't, you know. But that's a beauty because it's actually so simple that mm -hmm. people don't realize that actually it takes a bit more effort to actually get it to be more zen, if I can say. <laughs> um, yeah. But even then, just to have that little detail, right, uh, it, you know, it cost, it put up the production cost quite a bit. So mm -hmm. I think uh, with regards to um, especially uh, publishing books uh, or, or, you know, publishing your own books, self-publishing your books, I think financing is very, yes. is, is, is uh, you know, I, it is part of the, part of the question that you have to answer. You can't just, uh, you know, make a book and then it'll kind of magically appear. Hmm. Um, <clears throat> so, so um, when I was actually uh, making the book, I, I was actively thinking about uh, how I would finance the book because I've made a book before, so I roughly know mm -hmm. how much I could sell, uh, how many books I could sell, and uh, how much I'll be short. Because um, I... And because the fact that this time I'm actually uh, getting a designer on board, I had to pay design fees as well because the previous one I, I kind of designed, did the design myself. Uh, but luckily enough, because my subject matter is uh, photography and food, you know, during my uh, fundraising time, I actually started, uh, I made chili sauce and then I sold chili sauce uh, aside from prints. Uh, during the pre-order time, I, I started making this chili sauce that I came up with the recipe. And uh, I sold uh, chili sauce to raise funds. And, uh, you know, thankfully enough, my chili sauce, uh, which I'm still selling now, <laughs> is, um, is actually it, quite tasty. Um, if, you asked, uh, if you ask your friends... Uh, Anshika and uh, they love I my did, chili sauce. I did get to taste a little bit at Anshika's house. When oh, I you did? Okay. Just a little bit. The last text, she's like, you got to taste this. And uh, and sadly, as I said that, you know, I, I still haven't been able to get neither the book nor the chili sauce for myself. Uh, but hoping to get it at some point. And uh, uh, so that's actually quite uh, you know insightful to know that as a photographer the journey started with of course a sense of loss uh, you know when your father yeah. passed away and a, a lot of our personal projects actually in a very cliched sense do emerge from a sense of loss you know uh, yeah. a lot of times and it's uh, uh, kind of uh, almost endearing to see uh, how you have you know taken this whole project and your your feelings about your father and transformed it into uh, you know something that he used to do and yeah. uh, as a tribute you brought out this beautiful book you were also cooking everything yourself which is yeah. uh, i think the bigger task in the process and uh, Tell us about your cooking experiences. Like, yeah. what have they been like? Do you mess up the whole house? Is your wife tired of you cooking? Or does she... She loves my cooking. She <laughs> loves... My... We should she hear that go... from her. <laughs> I mean, she told me she's always dreamt of marrying a chef. And now she's kind of like, okay, I'll, you'll pass, you'll do. <laughs> her dream has come true. <laughs> yeah. No, but, uh, <clears throat> but going back to the personal project about uh, morning and all that. Because because I've seen because I've my experience with IP I've seen a lot of personal projects and and I, I didn't want to do a uh, project about a family member member passing away in a very sort of mournful manner. Yeah. You know, I wanted to celebrate his 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 life. His life. Because um, my father was a very pragmatic man. You know, he never. I've never seen him cry. I've never. You know, uh, he's very pragmatic. So you know, I didn't. Um, 
and also my, my mother and my father are old school people, right? So I didn't want to, even when the, the photographs, the edit I took, they were very straight images. They weren't, uh, they didn't have any high sort of artistic uh, uh, intention of, uh, you know, they were, most of the images were taken during a road trip back to my father's roots, the mm -hmm. village that he was born in. So if you saw, if you remember the edit, most of the pictures were taken then. And yeah. the edit, the edit that I did, I had actually made a dummy book ages ago when my father was still alive uh, as a record. Mm -hmm. So I actually showed this to him. Mm -hmm. So when he was alive, he actually saw these pictures. Wow. Uh, so my final book I did when he passed away, I kept most of it the same because it was something that he ex experienced. My food, he, he didn't yeah. experience. So I wanted to keep that part that he had experienced. Um, and and what uh, he, could you share like what, what he felt or what he said, some, something that you might remember when he saw this book taking shape? Okay, let me uh, share maybe some pictures. Uh, I have a picture of him looking at the edit. Let me see if I can find it. Oh. And that's him, right? Yeah, so that's, uh, that's him at front, in front of the restaurant. Oh. Uh, and he was very, yeah, he was very proud of this picture, you know, because that was, uh, I think this was his prime and the restaurant's prime. Mm -hmm. So actually, when I was doing this project, I, I, I posted in the Facebook group, uh, where in a Fijian Facebook group, and then asked anyone if anyone had pictures uh, of uh, okay, them in my father's restaurant right. and then a few people responded so these are pictures that actually my some of my father's old uh, patrons uh, sent to me how nice of them yeah because uh, to be true truth be told my father's restaurant was uh, quite popular it was one of the most popular restaurants uh -huh. when it was in its prime mm -hmm. so these were all sent in uh, so this is a picture of the chili so I've had like I've had like very uh, supportive friends that actually started buying my chili. So that, that actually helped me raise about 30% of the funds for my book. That's amazing. Incredibly, that actually helped me yeah, raise 30%. And was this idea completely your own or did it come yeah. out of a discussion with, you know, some friends? No, it, was, uh, it was completely my own. But I think it has to be start, it has to, I think whatever you do has to start from yourself. And for me personally, I love chili. And I've always dreamt of making my own chili. So actually, it, it just, the pieces just came mm -hmm. together. Uh -huh. I mean, and an interesting thing is uh, when I did this project, one of my father's first ever employee found me and reached out to me. Mm -hmm. So this is Dick. So he was one of the very, very, very first employees that my father employed when he first opened his restaurant so okay. he's retired now in in uh, in uh, New Zealand and I sent him a book when it was published oh. so he sent me a picture of my father's first restaurant so this oh, wow. this is before I was born oh wow so as you can see they're all like South Asian they're all like uh, Indian so that's the one wearing the white band that's dip so he oh. He is, he looks like this now. So he found, he, I connected with him, you know, uh, whilst doing this project. Uh, so that was quite, uh, quite interesting for me. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, what I find very interesting is that, uh, you know, a lot of photographers are now, uh, have been interested in bookmaking. Uh, but many of us don't really know how to go about it. Uh, one first is the edit process and stuff. And, and then also about, uh, of course, there is a, a little amount of self-publishing that certain photographers have uh, explored. But it's also very hard to manage everything on your own. And, and mainly it's the finances where everything comes and gets stuck. Uh, because you might need to produce a minimum number of copies, you know. Uh, and what's interesting is that you need to uh, 
not just produce the book, but also find innovative ways of selling the book. And this, your chili sauce idea is, is fantastic uh, as, as a strategy to kind of raise funds uh, for your book. And uh, in return, you've uh, got yourself an alternate career, Kevin. <laughs> Yeah, well, uh, the, the, the chili sauce, which I'm actually still selling now, uh, I see it as a continuation because I actually named the chili sauce after my father. Yes, So yes. my father's name is Poons. Yes. So actually, when people buy my chili sauce, they say, oh, can I get Poons chili sauce? So they, you know, so his legacy continues, you know. So, uh, you know, so I, that's the other element that I think is... Uh, uh, interesting for me, you know. Um, right. right. So I've just got a picture here. So when I was doing the uh, cooking, mm -hmm. after I cooked the dish, I would go to into my spare room where I set up a table and put a tablecloth and I took the pictures. Right. And that's how most of your uh, pictures of the dishes have been taken, right? Yes, yes. All like top down view. Top down view. Yeah. So this is a picture uh, many years ago when I actually did, did the first dummy of the photo book. And that's my father there mm. looking at the uh, spread. Mm -hmm. um, I remember, <laughs> I vividly remember just one question that he asked me. Mm. Uh, he asked, why are they all black and white? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was the only thing that I remember him asking. I can't remember thereafter. And what did uh, you say? <laughs> I can't remember. It's, it's quite, quite a while ago. But... The interesting thing that uh, uh, I see now is that when I show the book to my mother, mm -hmm. you know, he, she's able to like, oh, that's my husband. That's, you know, so I think uh, mm -hmm. it's, yeah, I think that's, to me, that means quite a bit when she actually flips, flips through and then she recognizes herself because she has right. a bit of dementia, right? So, but, yes. you know, she sees herself and she sees you know, my father who's passed away and my mm -hmm. sisters, you know, so I, I think um, the book itself, you know, it, it's not any sort of high art sort of uh, book, but it, it, to me, it holds like quite a special meaning to uh, my family. So, um, right. but luckily enough, you know, it, it, uh, it, you know, other people have resonated with the work as well. Um, Absolutely. And, uh, yeah. I can I can imagine because uh, even in India, like uh, yeah, this is a lovely photograph. I was going to ask you to <laughs> share this with us uh, on the screen. Uh, it's really interesting to see how with the camera, the book, and yeah. of course the walk that you have over there. Uh, yeah. That's uh, and it, and 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 is this usually the traditional sort of attire that you wear at home or casual? Yeah, at home? <laughs> actually, that that. Uh... That thing I'm wearing at the bottom, that's actually um, Burmese uh, Longyi, which is a sarong. Right. Which, is, uh, yeah, so, which but, I know. think, which, which a lot of people in Chennai actually wear it on a daily basis. And it's yeah, called yeah. HT or Lungi as well. So yeah. depending on, uh, uh, and it's interesting to see these similar threads as well uh, yeah. across cultures. Uh, yeah, they, they, they wear this in Fiji as well. They call it a Sulu. Oh, they do. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's interesting to know. That's interesting. Here's another print of the picking. Right. Uh, maybe I will just show one last video. Please right? do. Please do. Uh, which is kind of... Uh, 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 sort of uh, uh, skim through all the pictures of the food. Uh, so I'll, I'll just yes. play that now. It's, I think it's a short video. Sure. Ah. <laughs> You're making us hungry, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, 
Okay, so wonderful. Thank you so much. Yeah, and this is a lot of uh, very interesting food, and uh, I'm not able to focus anymore on what I'm supposed to talk to you because of all the <laughs> lovely dishes that I've seen. And uh, uh, and now, uh, I mean, what is your plan? Given you know that we are all in this state of isolation and social distancing, and um, people are not able to you know, meet each other or uh, how do you plan to make this book available going forward? Well, uh, the, the actually, actually the interesting thing is uh, before the, um, this whole COVID crisis thing happened, mm -hmm. I had actually started the next phase of my project, mm -hmm. which was to cook for people. So I had actually, um, started a supper club where I was uh, cooking for people. Uh, so I managed to, uh, I call it my father's name again. It's, it's called Poon's Supper Club. Mm -hmm. um, and I managed to do three sessions where people, you know, came to my house and I cooked. They paid and they came to my house and I cooked. Uh, so I just managed three sessions and this whole thing happened and now... Like that's kind of like uh, gone down the um, right, gone down the drain for a bit. So right. uh, yeah. Um, and is your family like? How do they react to these these interesting but kind of crazy ideas that you get of inviting strangers into your homes and you cook for them? And are they okay with something like this? Because I know a lot of times photographers are probably some of the hardest people to yeah. live with because they keep getting these ideas and. Yeah. You know, the families or your near and dear ones have to put up with it. So yeah. how, how do they feel about this? Uh... Well, uh, so far, it's, 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 they've been supportive. Uh, my wife has been very supportive. I mean, uh, uh, and, and uh, the sessions, right now I'm doing the sessions that I'm doing, they're mostly within my circle or my circle mm -hmm. circle. So it yeah, doesn't, yeah, yeah it, it's not like I, I go, you know, very wide. Okay. Uh, and uh, I only have a very small space in uh, in Singapore, as you know. Singapore property is very expensive, yes. so I only have a small house, mm -hmm. and I have a small table that fits eight. So um, at each time, I can like only host eight people. Um, so it's it's been okay, but uh, I, I'm 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 very uh, interested. I mean, this it's a totally new experience for me, and I, I find it very fascinating. Uh, I was talking. Um, I was talking to someone the other day, I can't remember who it was, mm -hmm. and we were talking about the photo and the food thing, and I was saying that with photography or art, or any art for that matter, you know, not, not everyone would have um, an opinion on art or photography. Mm -hmm. Like if you go down the street and you see an old lady there on the street and you show her a photograph, right, she might have no opinion on what the photo is or whether it's good or bad. But you give her a piece of food, right? A chicken or whatever. She will have an opinion. For she sure. will say, that's too salty or it needs more salt or, <laughs> you know. So it's been an interesting uh, experience for me. Uh, and I think and I, it's, it's... Yeah. yeah. And I think food has a language of its own. I mean, it's a, it's a different language with different cultures, but it's also a great binder, uh, irrespective yeah. of whether you're familiar with uh, that particular flavor or not. But I think when everybody sits on a table, as you were just mentioning, and yeah. bringing people together, and uh, I don't know how much they're interested in the photographs that you have you know, taken and you've added as part of the book. But I, I think that this is a great way to just bring people together you know, into yeah. a common shared experience. Yeah. Uh, uh, which is uh, really beautiful. 
Uh, I, I, I think we should open it up to some questions since we don't have uh, too much time. Uh, yeah. Maybe the yeah. audience, if they have some questions, they can share with us and we can forward them to you. Uh, you can share them in the Q&A box, which is there at the bottom. Uh, if anybody has any questions. Not yet, I guess. Uh, everybody's just so mesmerized by the food, I guess. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. yeah, I think the uh, while the questions come in or not, um, mm -hmm. my, my ultimate goal is because right now I, I've been doing photography for a while now, so people know me as someone that makes images. Mm -hmm. um, but the food thing is a new thing for me, you know, so I haven't uh, established myself as someone that cooks yet. Yeah. Know, of course, within my circle, there are people that know that I cook and that I have this chili, right? But beyond that, you know, it's not, uh, it's not like, every, oh, he's, he's a cook or whatever. Uh, so I think the next year or so, hopefully after this thing ends, would be for me to sort of build that up so yeah. that it matches my, my, uh, my sort of, uh, uh, matches my name as a photographer. And yeah. then from there, my dream is to bring the two together yes. somehow, uh, like, yeah. And so I think I it's know. also a way of continuing the legacy, uh, you know, yeah. that your father has left behind and not just end it maybe with this one book, uh, yeah. but really let it continue in, in probably various forms, whether you're cooking for friends or whether you're going to maybe have a restaurant of your own uh, yeah. eventually, uh, you know. And uh, so Anshika wants to know, that when are we getting the stock of the Poon's chili sauce? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would love to, you know, but unfortunately, the, the yeah. damn thing about Singapore is that, you know, the, the regular posts don't uh, accept uh, shipping of uh, sauces. So the only way to ship sauces overseas mm -hmm. is by DHL. And I mean, basically, I'll be working for DHL because they're going to charge me, charge the, the shipping will be a lot more than the sauce. So. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so that's a big bummer. So the only way to do it is, you know, the old school smuggling way. Someone comes in, smuggles it and takes it over. She says, bribe them with a crate of sauces. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've, had, I've had like quite a few people, because actually, and the other thing about sauces as well, you can't uh, take them. You can't, uh, you have to check them in on flights. Right. Yeah, so I've had a few people that came mm -hmm. from abroad and then took sauces, but didn't check them in and they got dumped at the... Right. Yeah, customs. So do, do, I'm sure uh, there are different permissions that are required when you do a commercial uh, sort of, uh, you know, project. Uh, uh, one is, of course, the book is different. So rules for selling the books and taxes and stuff are different. But for selling a food product with, uh, you know, do you need like clearances from food authority boards? And how, how, does, how do you manage all of that? Well, uh, interestingly enough, uh, in Singapore, right, they they uh, they allow um, they allow this. They have this scheme where it's home-based businesses where the you're allowed to make food or your condiments mm -hmm. uh, on a small scale. So my my what I'm doing now is small scale. It's not like massive yes. scale. But yes. I think once it goes to a big scale, then you need to mm -hmm. you know get a license and then you okay. need to. Uh, make it in a you know certified kitchen or whatever right. but at the moment you know uh, uh, you're allowed to do that and interestingly enough just last week uh, because we have lockdown here mm. the government banned uh, um, all these home-based uh, cooks doing selling condiments and all that because at the moment it's mm. also Ramadan right uh, Hari, Hari Raya Ramadan so actually the Malay community mm -hmm. a lot of the Ramadan uh, food and uh, sweets and all that are done by home-based cooks. Mm -hmm. So last week, uh, I think, yeah, last week the government kind of like said, oh, okay, home-based businesses cannot operate during this lockdown period because, you know, of community sort of, they are scared mm -hmm. of community sort of transfer of the spreading virus. Uh, but they overturned the decision. So actually from next week, they uh, were allowed to operate again. So actually I wasn't selling my chili for like, 
over a week and now mm -hmm. on the 12th onwards you're allowed to sell again yeah but you've managed to sell a fair bit uh, from what i was reading in one of the yeah yeah uh, it's yeah it's well my initial part pre book pre making the book you know i was able to raise enough to cover 30% right of the uh, of the cost Right. I think someone wrote. Wrote. I think there's yeah. a question. There's a question. Uh, Darpana uh, uh, asks, "How about a workshop on food making, photography, and eating in India? Sometimes once the borders open." Yeah, I, that's actually you know I, that would be my dream workshop where people come, <laughs> then we do photography, then we cook, then we eat, and then we you know have conversations, dialogue, whatever you know. So that. You know that that would be good. Uh, right. I'd be up for that. <laughs> <laughs> right. And there's another question uh, from Bala, uh, who says that there are these hundred traditional dishes belong to any. Do they belong to any community, country, or region? Okay. They they uh, they they they. I would say the best uh, way to describe them is they reflect my diaspora. So my diaspora, like uh, my my family background, is uh, Cantonese Chinese. So my father comes from a village of rice farmers in the southern part of China. So if, if, you are, if you're aware of uh, Cantonese food, right? Cantonese is very simple, clean, uh, not overly flavored. Uh, so that's kind of what my parents cook for us at home. Right. And then the other part that comes in is the, uh, the Indian influence in Fiji because I grew up with basically Indian chefs. Who, mm -hmm. cooked, who cooked Chinese food because my dad taught them how to cook Chinese food. So all the curries, the chili, the spice comes in as well. So actually my book has a mixture of all these kind of food. And also it has uh, a few dishes that are Fijian uh, because in Fiji, for example, they, they eat a lot of uh, root crops like taro, mm -hmm. taro uh, tapioca, so they eat root crops as a sub, sub, substitute for rice. Uh, so it has a bit of that. Uh, mm -hmm. And then of course, the last part of our lives uh, is in Southeast Asia, in Singapore. So that diaspora sort of comes in as, come, come in as well. Right, right, yeah. thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, uh, well, we There's did kind question. of talk about this, yeah, but uh, uh, Kevin, did the form of the book come first or did the project already commence and the designer came in at the time of making the book? Okay, uh, I had uh, edited, I had done a mock-up before, years ago. So essentially this, I gave this to her and I said, this is the photo part. So the sequencing, I did the sequencing and all that. Um, and the size, I, I'm not sure, is the size the same? Yeah, the size is exactly the same. So she kept to the same size, but then the fold is what she came up with. The this fold is, is what she came up with. The text layout is what she did. And then of course the other details like uh, the silver printing, you know, if you, can you see uh, it's shimmering? Yes. Yeah, so this, the cover is actually, has a silver paper wrap and uh, with black ink printed on it. So that's all her as well. Uh, yeah, so I think, uh, I would say the final form came from, you know, the designer and a little bit of input from me. But pretty much I, I let her sort of, uh, I think it's important that uh, to work with someone that knows how to do design. Like I had worked with her, uh, I had worked with her. Um, she had done something for my exhibition before, so I kind of knew what her sensibilities were. Right. And how much time did it take for you to sort of first, you know, construct the book uh, yourself in your head and then actually, you know, maybe digitally and, and see how it's all coming together and then finally do the printing and publishing of the book? Like, what was the time frame that you spent uh, over there? From the... Right from the point where you started thinking about putting the book together and putting all the images, really cooking mm -hmm. and you know making those images to 
yeah. uh, really laying it all out, the back and forth with the designer. So, and finally the printing and publishing of it. So what are the kind of time frames? Because this is quite an exhaustive sort of yeah. process. Uh, actually, when I first uh, started the project and started cooking and all that, uh, I didn't really think of it as a book. So I just wanted to uh, make the, the food. So initially, when I started cooking, uh, they didn't look nice. The food didn't look nice. You know, I was more concerned with the taste and the recipe. Yeah. So I, I didn't really pay attention to the, how it looked and how it plated. Yeah. It was only like maybe uh, two, three weeks into it that I thought, okay, maybe I should pay attention to documenting this process. Yeah. So I started documenting it on Facebook first. And then from there, you know, the realization that I should be taking better pictures, you know. So it started like that. And then at some point I said, okay, this sh I should make a book um, because I already have the, the photo book, the, the dummy. So I should combine it with the food and it makes sense. Mm -hmm. So from there, I, I, while I was probably at my uh, uh, past the halfway mark of the dishes, like maybe 60, 50, mm -hmm. I asked her to come in, uh, the designer to come in and have a chat. And I told her about what I was doing. Mm -hmm. uh, so from there till, uh, I think it was um, mid-year. Mm -hmm. Mid last year, yeah. Yeah, mid last year. Mm -hmm. And I told her that I want, my deadline was in August. It was August, September. Because actually that was my father's uh, one, one year anniversary of his passing. So I wanted a oh, finished really, book. Yeah. I wanted a finished book on the day he passed away, a year later. Mm. So we, it kind of went backwards and then we were able to pull it off, uh, go to the printers and uh, the printer was able to courier one copy to me on the day itself. So the whole run, the whole print run wasn't finished, but the printer rushed out one copy on the actual day of my father's passing. So it took one year, it took yeah. like one, one year. Wow. wow. Yeah. And I think it's uh, because maybe, see, sometimes uh, we, we feel that the printers may or may not, you know, deliver bases, whatever other stuff they have in their pipelines. But sometimes, uh, because this is a personal project and, and maybe they understand the emotional value of this yeah. book and the project, uh, yeah. You know, uh, this this is where it weaves in a thread between very different people from very different industries, be it design, be it, you know, people who are coming to share the food with you. Uh, and of course, your own family uh, and their being yeah. part of the process is extremely integral uh, yeah. to, to the making of this book. Uh, and it's beautiful as an experience. How do you feel? I mean, now that you know, the book was ready and I'm sure it must have been an emotional moment for you on that day when you got the first copy, because till then it's so much about process, process and process. Yeah. And yeah. do you recollect how you felt, uh, you know, on that day when you held the book for the first time? Well, I, I, I felt, uh, I felt a relief that, okay, it's, it's done now. It's, it's finished. And I have, I was able to get it, you know, on the day itself. And, and I felt uh, uh, I mean I felt like I achieved something you know because it, it was you know um, it took a while to actually put together uh, and it came out uh, very close to what I envisioned it to be I mean like in a loose sense mm -hmm. so yeah and uh, I, I showed it to my mother and my mother flipped through it and then she you know, she was pointing people out. Uh, uh, so, he, you know, yeah. It, uh, was and very, did you very... also document some of these moments, like when you handed it yeah. to your mother? And yeah, yeah. There's a, yeah, there's a, you know, I have like loose iPhone videos here and there. Okay. Uh, I don't have that with me now, but yeah. That's okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. That's nice. Yeah. Okay. And maybe one last question before we wrap up. Uh, Shrota Acharya. Hi, Shrota. Thanks for joining us. 
uh, instead of taking up an established uh, business, why and when did you decide to take up photography? Uh, okay, actually, I have another established business. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, uh, I have another sort of a company that uh, my uh, my partner. I have a partner in the company. He kind of looks after it. So it's it's like a branding marketing company that does uh, that's been around since uh, uh, two thousand. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of running, but everyone's kind of working from home now. But Right. Most of the work there is, I have a great partner and he kind of handles most of the, the work there. And this um, comes from your background uh, as a creative director uh, yeah, for many yeah. years earlier, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. So, okay. so before I actually started, you know, picking up the camera myself, I, I, I was working with photographers as a creative director, art director. You know. yes. um, so it wasn't until later that I decided, okay, you know, I'll pick up the camera and I'll, you know, start practicing myself as well. Right, yeah. right. Uh, just one last uh, comment that's come in. Uh, the photos when combined makes an interesting tapestry. Is that deliberate or did it shape up naturally? Uh, and also from Gayatri, what's Kevin's favorite recipe from the book? Um, okay, the photos when combined makes an interesting tapestry. Uh, is it the food photos? Yeah. Uh, no, um, I didn't, when I, uh, you, you're talking about this one, I'm assuming, yeah? Yes, I guess. So it wasn't, uh, it wasn't deliberate in the sense that I looked, uh, looked at it like visually. Uh, of course, I took everything top down and I wanted a round plate. So that was how I wanted to visualize it. But it's essentially the way it's organized. It's all the chicken is together, all the soups are together, all the fried stuff are together. And by, by, by that's how it came out by default. Like I, I wasn't trying to sequence them because I, I, it was more to be logical in terms of a recipe book format. So all the, if I wanted to cook a chicken dish, you know, all the chicken dishes are there. And then, and then it came out and it kind of worked. Um, so that's the question. Um, right. And which is your favorite recipe from the book? Um, I mean, there's a lot of favorite. I love my curries and all that. Uh, but I think uh, I, I, if I were to just pick one to highlight, I would pick uh, the last recipe, which is actually a very, very simple dish. It's a rice roll. It's a rice roll? Ah. Uh -huh. It's a rice roll that is steamed. Steamed from steamed. rice flour, made with rice flour, steamed, and then uh, with a bit of uh, soya sauce. Um, I, I put that, it's actually recipe 100, because I, 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 I will highlight that, because basically, uh, no, it's not popular. It's, uh, it's called chi chang fan. Chi uh, chang <laughs> fan is not popular. Um, uh, I, I will highlight that, because basically, for the last, 10 years in Singapore, that's what my father ate every morning, huh. which is these rice rolls with a bit of soy sauce and a bit of like oil. So, and not with the Boone's chili sauce. No, I mean, <laughs> that, that came much later because okay. he has a very, he has a very sort of traditional Cantonese palate. So everything has to be, yeah. you know, very simple and very delicately flavored. Right. So he ate that like every morning. So I, I picked that um, as the, if I were to highlight one, I'll pick that because actually I don't have the equipment to make it properly. So for me to actually make one, it takes me about 10 minutes to make one. I okay. think about 10 minutes to make one. Mm -hmm. So, and 30 minutes to make three at home with whatever equipment I have. So I think the labor in terms of making such a very simple dish uh, I think was is interesting to sort of spotlight, uh, and that's the dish that my father ate for the last <coughs> ten years of his life, every morning. Yeah. Wonderful. Uh, I think we are just uh, about uh, in time to close this discussion. 
And uh, thank you so much, Kevin. It, it has been really a wonderful journey. Uh, I know maybe you've lived it over and over again as many times you might have had this conversation with different people. But uh, I think for people over here, uh, it's really very interesting to see how somebody who was not really a photographer earlier became a photographer and now uh, is also cooking uh, something you know, many, many, in fact, dishes, uh, and making a beautiful book out of it in memory of someone you love. That's, that's entirely is a very beautiful journey. I know in India that uh, we all talk about our grandmother's recipes, which are the legacy of each family, you know, these ancestral recipes uh, that people are extremely possessive about. Uh, of course, there are a lot of marketing brands also that, you know, label it as grandmother's recipes to make it more authentic. But uh, I guess this, the story, the journey is equally important, uh, you know, in, in your case. And uh, thank you so much for sharing that with us. Uh, it's been great. I'm sure uh, many of us are waiting for the restrictions to end so that we can get our Poon's chili sauce and the book, of course. Yeah. Um, so please keep at least uh, my copy <laughs> with you and I will probably get it, you know, whenever uh, yes. soon some time. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you so much for having me. I mean, it's been a long while since I actually talked about the book. I think, yeah. Uh, so it was a uh, nice, uh, nice to actually, you know, open the book up and talk about it again. So yeah, thanks for having me. Um, I think maybe the last uh, thing I'll say is uh, the last few weeks, because I've been locked down, I've been like, you know, being very productive. So I've I've actually been putting out like cooking videos and <laughs> photography editing videos. So <laughs> if you go to my Instagram slash Instagram, you'll actually see that I I am continuing this 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 journey with the cooking and the photography. So you can check it out. Uh, Wonderful. We are going to follow you, and hopefully some of us will try some of these recipes. I know, not me. I'm not want to experiment so much. Actually, I, I also come from a family of uh, bakers, actually. Oh, nice. And, uh, uh, but I don't know how to bake a cake. And that's how, as bad well, as it gets. <laughs> because... Well, I'll tell you that one, I, I tried to make gulab jamun at home and I failed. So that's not, so that's not actually in the recipe book because I failed. <laughs> well, a failure is part of the process. Yeah, but... yeah, yeah, it is, yeah. <laughs> It is. I'm sure you must have also not got certain things right you know, yeah, the yeah. first time. But uh, this has been great. And we really hope uh, that there will be another time when we meet in person. And hopefully you'll cook for us. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I hope it was uh, enjoyable and interesting for everyone who joined. Uh, thank you so thank much. Thank you, Kevin. Take care. Take care and follow him. On Kevin W.I. Lee, that's one of his Insta handles. I've already shared the Poon Supper Club as well. And maybe yeah. if you do uh, a hashtag of 100 daughters, 100 patients, 100 recipes, then you'll get to see all the, sorry, meals. Yeah. Uh, you'll get to see all the uh, photographs from the book as well. And of all the meals that he's been cooking. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take Have care, everybody. Have a good evening. Bye. Bye.